You want it? We have it. The hottest mortgage and real estate strategy broadcast in the nation. A Smarter Way Home with your host, Danielle Boot and Victor Bales. 50 years combined experience ranked in the top 1% in the nation for Home Loan Originations 2020. Promise to expand your knowledge, utilizing creative mortgage financing and home buying strategies. Build a bridge for a better quality of life. Get your brain cells firing for a smarter way home. And welcome to another episode of A Smarter Way Home. We've got modern mortgage and real estate buying strategies for real estate professionals and consumers alike. My name is Victor Bales. I am your host. And I want to introduce my co-hostess, my hostess with the mostest, loan officer extraordinaire, Mrs. Danielle Boot. How are you today, Victor? <laughs> Pretty good. It was kind of a, some good pre-show uh, conversations we had there today. It was kind of fun. So, Danielle, what kind of show we got today? We got a very special guest. Uh, we do have a special guest today. So it is my pleasure to introduce Nick Coppola. He is with EXP Realty. He'll give us more about his background, but he is a good friend, um, a pro very professional realtor, has been in the industry for many years. So we're going to hear a little bit about his pr perspective on the market and where real estate is going in Southeast Michigan today. Welcome, Nick. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you both for having me today. It's uh, exciting to be here. I was uh, honored to be invited to, to tell you both. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, it's not often that you get to have a platform to talk about the industry. So this is a pretty special event for me. Well, Nick, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. What is your current role right now to our consumers and uh, our professionals out there? I am one of the managing brokers for eXp Realty for the state of Michigan. Um, eXp, what they do is, is they are a, um, unlike some of the traditional models that you see out in the marketplace that are franchised owned, independently owned and operated with a major label on it, like a C21 or something like that. EXP is a corporation that is publicly traded on the stock exchange. They have agents in all 50 states. Um, as of yesterday, they just crossed 75,000 agents worldwide. They're opening other countries. We just opened the Dominican Republic. So each state has a managing broker team. They have a designated managing broker, and then they have additional managing brokers, because as you can imagine, it would be pretty hard to manage all those agents for one broker. So I'm part of that uh, state broker team. There's four of us. Well, in order to even get to that level, you have to have some experience here, Nick. So why don't you take us back? Uh, who are you? Uh, where'd you grow up? What got you in the, in the industry? And how'd you end up landing here? So, you know, it's funny. Uh, none of us wake up as a child and say, I want to be a real estate professional when I get older. It's normally fireman, policeman, doctor, lawyer, you know, one of those garbage kind of things. Garbage uh, man. Garbage man. Yeah. I want right? to be a garbage man. School teacher, mm -hmm. all noble professions. Um, so Nick was a kid that grew up with some parents that uh, owned their own business and worked for them. Um, my father was fortunate enough to sell his business um, and retire at 51 years old, which was incredible, especially back in the, the late 80s. Um, what kind of business was that? My father owned a collision shop. Okay. That's what he did for a living. He huh? was a, a body man by trade. He was a really talented guy. Um, and I was graduating from high school. He's, I graduated in, in May of 88. My father sold the business in September of 88. And it was, you know, now you're going to go to college and, and, you know, figure out what you're going to do. Right. So a friend of mine, his brother owned a, a bar slash restaurant, so he gave me a job, and I was working there while I was going to college, and I ultimately decided that I was going to get into food service management. I thought that that would be a lot of fun, mm -hmm. right? So I graduated with my associate's degree in food service management, and I am, um, you know, managing this bar restaurant, right? You know, I'm a 21-year-old punk that's, yeah. you know, thinking I'm really hot now, right? And... Um, what bar was that, if you don't mind me asking? It's no longer there. Oh. Yeah, it's no longer there. It's <laughs> Vic's gone wondering, yeah, has yeah. he been there? Yeah, it's, it was a fun Trip time. down memory was, lane yeah, here. Yeah. So my father was an avid car collector. He had um, several yeah. classic cars, antique cars. He restored cars. That's what he did in his, his time after he retired. He had another building that he had, and he would work on his own vehicles. 
And so it was a Sunday in August and I went to a car show and one of my father, my father has a car in there and one of his friends who was a real estate broker had his car there. So I had seen, you know, Bob and, and, you know, he had known me from the time I was a little kid, you know, and he said, Hey, you know, how are you? What are you doing with yourself now? And I said, Oh, I graduated, you know, with a associate's degree in food service management. I manage a restaurant, you know? And, um, he was so funny. He said, he's like, well, he's like, you should get your real estate license. And I was kind of sort of taken back and was like, well, I don't think you heard me. I'm managing a restaurant, right? You know, like I've already got a job. You know, I've I'm, landed. Yeah, I'm yeah. good, dude. <laughs> and uh, he was so funny. He's like, well, you should get your real estate license. He goes, I'll tell you what, I'll pay for the class, you know? So this is August. And by September, I had gotten my license. And um, I, you know, I... It's going to do both, right? You know, I'm 21. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm thinking I'm, you know. You are the promised uh, man. Yeah, I'm yeah. in the pro, you know. So <laughs> I didn't know squat, to be quite frank with you, you know. So um, I started, you know, I kept my job at the at the restaurant and the bar and, and still did that at nights and weekends and all that stuff. And uh, I sold some real estate with him, you know, and he he owned a small brokerage. And, and Bob was a great guy. He's no longer here. If he was here, to be quite honest with you, I would, you know, hug him, kiss him. You know, because the career has been great for me. Mm-hmm. So I owe him a lot of gratitude for that. And um, it was funny because first year in the business, I literally almost got out. I was rookie of the year. Um, I had sold 13 houses, which was incredible for year one back yeah. in, you know, 1990. You know, I started September of 90, so it was 91. And but the problem was, is that I was in, um, you know, a city where the average sales price was like 45 grand. And do the math. I was on a 50 50 split and I sold 13 houses at 50 grand a piece. I didn't make any money at all. I was making way more money at the restaurant. So I was like, this is stupid. Uh-huh. And now I'm 22. I'm like, this is, this is dumb. Uh-huh. Like, why should I keep doing this? So I fortunately met somebody else in the industry. And this particular gentleman sold one of my listings. We went out to lunch afterwards. And this was way before the recruiting craze that you see now, right? Right. right. And Larry was a really great guy. And he said, hey, he said, "Uh, go to lunch with me, you know. So we go to lunch and he said, you know, tell me about your career. They say, I knew I was young and he was older than I was. So I'm telling him and I told him at lunch, I said, I'm getting out, actually. This is my last deal. Once I close this up and get my commission check, I'm gone. And um, he said, well, why? You know, and I said, well, because I'm not making any money. He's like, yeah, but you're doing all the right stuff. You're just doing it in the wrong place. And so I literally had to make the tough decision to leave the brokerage that I started with a year later, which was my dad's friend, which was really hard. Right. Yeah. And go somewhere else. And I did. And once I did that, it, it really opened up a bunch of doors. So I sold from September of 90 up until about 96. Um, I actually jumped in the mortgage side for about five years. I was a mortgage loan officer. I did both from 96 to about 2000. Um, I met a really wonderful gal who was also in the mortgage biz. So we decided after we got married that it didn't make sense for both of us to be mortgage loan officers. And I would just stop trying to do both. And I would just focus on the real estate side. And then I obtained my broker's license in 2001. Um, I spent a good 15 years doing mentoring, training, new agent training, selling, um, and then I managed a, a local brokerage here in Livingston County for about four years and then made the switch over to EXP yeah. and, and their brokerage team. So that's the short version, yeah. long version, but short version. So yeah. it's uh, it's been a good good run. But uh, you grew up in Livonia. I did. I actually grew up in Livonia. Yep. Uh, right at Five Mile and Middle Belt area as a kid. Great place to grow up, by the way. Uh, a ton of fun. Um awesome memories in, in that, in that area. Um, but people always ask, you know, sometimes, well, Hey, how'd you end up in Pinckney? You know? Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, I married a nice girl from Pinckney. How the hell do you think I ended up? <laughs> right. You know, you that's ran happens, to Pinckney. Right? Yeah. Well, you know, Nick, I don't know like, if you knew this, but I used to have a crush on your sister, Anita, cause we went to junior high together. You know oh, what? Oh yeah, yeah. I forgot yeah, that there's yeah. this weird, oh, yeah. weird connection Vic and yeah, I have yeah. seven yeah. degrees of Kevin Bacon <laughs> over here. Yeah. Right. So no, it's true. And it's, it's funny because we, we realized it. 
when when we met up with each other, you know, he recognized the last name and he's like, hey, Cop-, you know, Vic, you know, he's Coppola, Coppola. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I knew a girl named Anita Coppola. Do you know her? I'm like, yeah, it's my older sister. Yeah. <laughs> the girl that used to smack me upside the head yeah. for leaving the toilet seat up. You I know think what? she used yeah. to smack me upside the head, too. <laughs> Get away, Vic. <laughs> no. You know, it's so funny. My daughter, I'll tell you, this is a stupid story to bring up today. But my daughter, you know, is 16 and a few years back, you know, the neighbor people, had asked if she would babysit their little boy and stuff like that. And she's been babysitting Ryan now for, I don't know, a good three years, four years or whatever. I go, man, Ryan's so lucky. Like, he's going to someday realize that he had a crush on his really cute babysitter. I'm like, I got cheated of that. I had two older sisters, and they did not want to watch me at all because they were like five and six years older than I was. They were forced so they treated me horribly when they had to watch us. I didn't have like the cool. Oh babies. yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know I mean? yeah. You know, it was, it's kind of one of those. Well, but go ahead. Sorry. Well, let's let's fast forward. So now you're running yeah. EXP, and uh, you know I've heard EXP is only for really experienced agents that they don't have for the new agents. Uh, they may not have the support because their model is actually a little cheaper on fees for the agents. Could you explain that? Is that a myth? What's going on there? So, yeah, that that actually is a myth. I mean, uh, first of all, EXP um, has a wonderful split. They've got an 80-20 split, but the cap is not the cheapest in the industry, and it's not the most expensive in the industry. Um, Part of the model is, is the revenue share piece of it, right, to build an additional revenue stream, also get some stock. You're already selling real estate anyway, so you might as well participate in those programs that allow you to generate some additional Ooh. revenue as an agent. Well, you just said a lot of stuff there. Can you break yeah. those down a little sure. bit? Take us through the elements of why an agent may gravitate towards you and what makes EXP better sure. because you're working for them and you must believe in them as well. I do believe in the model. You know, what happened was is that uh, COVID... Um, change the game, right? So here I am managing a traditional brick and mortgage, more eh, brick and mortar office during COVID, right? COVID hits, now all of a sudden we're locked down, right? You've got to you got to figure out a way to do this. And for those of you that you know aren't in the real estate business, when COVID first hit and they shut everything down, the real estate industry in terms of brokers, mm-hmm. we were shut down. Like we couldn't show. We couldn't do anything, right? Mortgage was a little different because they were considered financial services. You mm-hmm. guys could still close things and stuff like that. So we really had to scramble. It's the only time in my life I became essential to somebody. There you, you go, know, right? <laughs> so I, as a manager of a brick and mortar, I'm now struggling to figure out how do I embrace my people, right? I've got all these agents. How do I get them engaged? We were set up for nothing. We didn't have Zoom. We didn't have, I mean, we had an intranet quote unquote, you know, as a company, but we weren't set up. Not really digital. Not really digital, right? We were traditional. And the company I worked for is an older company that was very, very brick and mortar roots, right? So scrambling, we had to learn on the fly, right? Well, if you look at a company like EXP, they were already doing that. And during COVID, they didn't skip a beat. And it was really interesting to figure out like, holy smokes, look at what they're doing here. They're recruiting agents, they're retaining agents, and they don't have one physical office anywhere. They have an, a, a, what we call a shared office because you need a physical address in the state of Michigan in order to have a, more, you know, a real estate company, but they don't have this 5,000 square feet and they don't have multiple cities where they have all these offices and things like that. And they're still effectively doing this. So how are they doing it? Well, they're, they're figuring out a way to be efficient with technology is what they're doing. And when you start looking at that, so that, that was kind of what was the catalyst for me to look at the industry a little bit differently because I had to change. And you asked me about my past, right? So good and bad that I got in the industry in 1990, but the bad was is that I had always been trained on this brick and mortar platform. Or, or pro, do, you, right? do you remember the MLS books? Uh, that's what I had. Back we in had, the 90s, yeah. You had a book. So and, it's funny because you think about, you know, where the industry has gone. And, and I think about like the game changers, right? So, you know, reflecting, right, on your long career. When we got a fax machine that was plain paper, that was a game changer. Doesn't yep. sound like it today, but I'm telling you, as somebody who lived it, that was yeah. a game changer. We got yeah. a pager. That right. was a game changer. When we got email, yeah. that was a game changer. Didn't oh, yeah. seem like it. 
but it was a game changer, right? The internet in the early 2000s was now a game changer, right? So if I look at the industry and I look at where it's gone, it has changed more in the last five years than it did in the previous 25 years. And it has changed faster than it ever has before. We're seeing the same thing in the mortgage industry. I'm sure you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I don't doubt it. Um, So that was the the catalyst for saying, okay, let's, let's look at EXP a little bit deeper here. Let's see what they're actually doing. And then you start looking at, okay, I'm going to unpack what I said, right? right? So here's the misnomer with new agents, right? It's always so funny as a, as a manager and, and recruiting agents and retaining agents. You know, I get a brand new agent that's licensed. They come in and they go, hey, I'm thinking about joining ABC Real Estate, blah, 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 blah. What's your commission split? I'm going to be honest with you, new agents, if you're listening, you haven't sold a freaking thing. Uh-huh. The commission split actually means absolutely nothing to you until you actually do a deal. Right. right. So unless you have, you know, 14 deals in the hopper the day you get your license, you're really in no position to actually negotiate your commission split. Right. So what happens is, is that people focus on the wrong things. They come in and they ask about the split. Then they ask about the training. Then they ask about, you know, Who's the broker? How do I get support? Okay, those type of things. Well, EXP has addressed all those things. They said, hey, right up front, we're going to give you an 80-20 split. And what does 80-20 mean? Okay, so let's just say I earn a $1,000 commission. We're going to use simple math because we're, you know, no, don't no. have calculators. I don't want to take my shoes off to count. Um, and there's a $1,000 commission. 80% of that commission or $800 would go to the agent. 20% okay. of that commission would go to EXP Realty. So that's okay. what an 80-20 split means for simple okay. purposes for today, yep. right? Obviously, if you have a deal that's more commission than that, the numbers change, but that's the gist of so it. So the right? agent gets 80% of the take. 80% of the take, right? Now you talked about a cap. What does a cap mean? So a cap is a set amount for your annual contract. So whenever you join a brokerage, at least with EXP, I can't speak for other brokerages, I can only speak for them, you have an anniversary date. So if I join today, my anniversary date would be March 1st. So from March 1st to February 28th of 2023, I have a $16,000 cap. I need to do about, at an 80-20 split, I need to do about $2.7 million to Under pay, today's market under and today's average sales market, price. Now. Exactly. I need to do about $2.7 million in volume to pay EXP $16,000, and then I take the rest. Okay. okay. But as, as they're closing deals... They're getting 80% of the take and on the next deal, the 80% until they hit this cap. Correct. And then what happens? So then they're at a hundred percent after that, they get all of the commission. So we use that same thousand dollar commission. They would get the whole entire thousand. So what happens to uh, like admin fees? How do they get copies and uh, you know, how, how do they operate and get support? Okay, so we talked about the um, managing brokers, right? So EXP is the only real estate company in the world that has what's called EXP World. They have their own virtual platform. Um, It sounds funny, but I actually have an avatar in that actual world. I have an office in that actual world. Um, I sit on a broker floor as a managing broker in that world. And you as an agent could come into the world, literally make an appointment with a broker, literally grab a ticket if you're a walk-in, if you don't have a scheduled appointment. So think about it like a doctor, right? You might have an appointment for your physical every single year, and that's a standing appointment. But if you get sick next week, you call the doctor and say, hey, I'm really sick. Is there a way you can get me in today? They allow for so many walk-ins is ultimately what they do, right? It's a very, very similar setup to that. So not only are you getting four managing brokers, we have three what we call agent service coordinators. We have three compliance contract specialists. We have three transaction settlement specialists. We have two concierge services specialists in this actual world. So think about it like this. You are actually at a hotel. You want to make dinner reservations for a steakhouse on Friday night. You ask the front desk, hey, what's a good steakhouse? And they say, please talk to Danielle, the concierge. She will make reservations for you and also provide transportation. That's what our concierge service does. So it allows the brokers to not wear 14 different hats like you would normally have in a traditional brick and mortar, right? I might direct traffic 
So you might come into me and say, hey, I'm having such and such a problem. And I say, you know what? That really isn't an area of expertise for me. That's more of a technical issue. Let me put you in touch with John, the concierge, so he can get you taken care of today, right? So you're specializing what you're doing and you're making your brokers far more, more proficient, right? I maintain that the agents get better support in this environment than they do in a traditional brick and mortar because even myself, when I was running a brick and mortar, I couldn't be everywhere all the time. And with four of us, you can divide and conquer. I can take care of Danielle. Somebody else can take care of Vic, Uh so on and so forth, right? I've put so-and-so with the agent service coordinator because that's what they need. And you you take this system and you start breaking it down. And that's what EXP has figured out in the virtual environment, which is different than virtual. So, So me as an agent, I have this virtual environment to give me all the support, all the education, all the training I need, which is cool. So let's go, let's flip to the other side. Let's look at the client interface. Me as an EXP agent, I have a client. Where do I meet them? How do I bring them into the office to sign? How how is that interface and how is a consumer uh, uh, adapting to that? So they're adapting very well. And as you, you look at our, if you look at our society and the way we're adapting to things, we're doing more things independently. We're doing more things digitally, right? So what comes what becomes important is that piece of technology. So we're using electronic signing platforms. We're using agents, excuse me, can meet wherever they need to meet. It could be a Starbucks. It could be a Panera Bread. It could be, you know, at, I don't even know the client's house. It could be wherever, the library. There's all kinds of places to actually meet people. What happens is, is that if you really think about it, and I think about my own career, I haven't had anybody in the last five years say, well, I really need to meet you at your office. Right. I haven't had anybody say that. And I don't think on the mortgage side, you're seeing that as much anymore. You guys are doing more remotely than you ever have. Look, I was a mortgage loan officer for 10 minutes. And I remember literally taking the thick package and going to somebody's house and getting them to sign sign everything. right? Right. And then bringing it back and giving it to my processor. That doesn't happen anymore. You guys send out an electronic package. It's timed. You call the person. You say, hey, by the way, I need you to sign the electronic package. I can see that you actually got the email. I can see that you actually didn't open it. I can see that you've only signed half of it. Same thing applies on the real estate side. Well, it's funny because uh, the pandemic is actually... I thought brought the loan officers into a whole nother world because sure. now with the Zoom technology, I had, I think I got more conversion rates with clients meeting on Zoom because it is technically, it's like a face to face, but yeah. it's very convenient for the consumer. Right. And I think, you know, it's what the younger people love it because you can say, I can say to a client, Hey, get your kids to bed and let's meet at seven 30 on Zoom. Right. And I can still screen share. I can still show you documents that I would show you face to face. And then, you know, once you establish that, for instance, in our world at the pre-approval phase, and you build that trust, everything else digitally is going to be fine. And, you know, sometimes people say, well, what about older people? Okay. Are they going to do the digital world? And a lot of times they do. You know, if somebody is healthy and their mind is sharp and, you know, it, it doesn't matter what your age is, you can still embrace the technology. And frankly, sometimes older people have more time than Absolutely. younger people to embrace the technology. Well, I, I, I see a, I see a double edged sword there. Me thinking from an outsider on an EXP model that the older agents who like that face to face old type mentality say, I may not want to gravitate to an EXP model with a virtual world, whereas the newer agents, which we need the new blood in here, will just gravitate towards that type of model. Do you have those type of conversations? We do. Um, And this didn't come from EXP. This comes from Nick, right? I've been saying this to my agents for years during, you know, training when I was a manager, not being a managing broker, whatever it is. You have to meet people where they are not where you want them to be, right? So when you unpack that statement, you think about that is, is look, if I have an older client that wants to meet me in person, absolutely, I'm gonna meet them in person. This isn't one size fits all. It never has been one size fits all. It wasn't one size fits all 30 years ago, and it's not one size fits all today. And it never will be. It's always gonna be a hybrid of where people are at. So guess what? 
I've got the millennial. They don't even want to talk to me. They want to text. I'm going to meet you where you are. Okay. Not where I want you to be. I've got, you know, the elderly grandmother who wants to meet me in person and see my face and physically wet sign documents. I'm going to print them and I'm going to meet her where she is. So you're always going to meet people where they are, not where you think they should be or not where you want. I've them never to thought be. of it that way. Mm-hmm. You know, I used mm-hmm. to make house calls. Sure. Oh, yeah. Or meet clients at McDonald's. So you wouldn't make a house call today? I I just never, it it, it crossed my mind. They seem to have gone away. And now that we got Zoom, I I just say, oh, well, we can Zoom or you can come into the office. I never Mm -hmm. think about, hey. But if I referred my my 83-year-old mother to you for a mortgage and she called you and said, my son told me to call you, Victor. But I don't do, I don't have a computer. So if you want to do business with me, you're going to have to bring documents and a pen. Would you say, oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Coppola, I can't help you today. You would do a house call. That's yeah. what you would do. Well, if Anita called, I, I would you go. You would do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she uses a computer. I can tell you that for sure. She'd be like, uh, no, Victor. No, Vic, stay in your virtual world. Yeah. <laughs> so so that's that hasn't changed. And the virtual world, in my opinion, fits nicely into that because it provides additional options. Hey, why? That's, that's well, unbelievable. That's, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, one of the things that we've heard about, and I'd love to get your opinion yeah. on, because we've had a lot of big industry players try to get into real estate, try to get in the mortgage world. And we have heard for years that, hey, there's not going to be loan officers in 10 years, and there also won't be real estate agents in 10 years. There, there are actual national companies that think that they could put an electronic lockbox on a house, give a potential buyer a code and let themselves into someone's house to view it. And then they think that they can write, you know, do some digital platform to write an offer with no agents involved, you know, and you kind of look at that and go, okay, I know I'm not on the younger side of the generation any longer, but I look at that as a potential buyer and a potential seller. And, and I've said for 10 years now, I said, I'm not worried about my job going to become extinct because financing is not necessarily getting easier and there is a human element to it. You know, we see it in our world, for instance, when a customer goes to a big box lender or an online lender and, you know, if they get their loan on the conveyor belt and it moves down that conveyor belt, sure, they're going to close. Sure. But if there's any complication, they're going to fall off the conveyor belt and then nobody is ever going to know what's going to happen because there's not enough human beings involved to be able to pick up that transaction and go, oh, shoot, here's a problem. Let's fix it and get this closed. I also see the same thing in the real estate world. You know, how would you feel as a seller if potential buyers could get a lockbox code to your home and walk in by themselves? Now, we, we, I thought about that during COVID, right? There were a lot of concerns for people selling homes with germs, you know, and, and everything, right? We, everybody's been freaked out for two years, but you also look at that and even nationwide, there's been an increase of crime. With real estate agents. Yes. People getting murdered out of an open house, kidnapped. I mean, horrible, horrible things. You go, I don't want strangers in my home unless they're with an agent that is known, you know, and they have a pre-approval letter. So we know that this is a legit person to try to protect all parties involved. But you just go, okay, some of it seems like beyond the Jetsons, you know? Sure. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I just want to work on Danielle's point there because the human interface is never going to go away. Um, we had this on a previous mm-hmm. show. We talked about this, that home buyers or home sellers say, why do I need a realtor? All they do is open the door for me. Sure. Yeah. That's sure. what you want is to when you close on that transaction is think that realtor only opened the door because they have no clue of what has happened behind the scenes with the addendums, with the title, with all the scheduling, all the nightmares that happen. And if a realtor can shield their client from that and be that, that, uh, that, I guess, hitting bag, right. To take up all the punches, you, that's a good experience for your client. If you think your realtor only opened the door, that's the best realtor. Even from a negotiating standpoint, it's like, if you don't have a human being, a buyer's agent working on your behalf, 
how do you negotiate with the seller? Are we going to turn real estate into an online car buying experience? Well, will you pay this price or not? You know, and in you go, okay, but uh, yeah, we're, you know, and it's interesting again, EXP has got a very, let's call it a fresh approach. Sure. Very digital approach, but that's still powered by human beings. Well, absolutely. I mean, there's no, uh, look, there's, you know, I don't want to make this throwing out stats. I mean, we, we passed 2000 agents in the state of Michigan last week, 10 days ago, we're going to hit 2,100 agents by the end of this week as a company, they've hit 75,000 agents worldwide this week. Um, when I first got to EXP, they were at 69,000. It, 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 the growth is, is crazy. Those are people. Right. Those are real that's people. That's like 75,000 people. 75,000 agents. Well, that, that's like the, the Super Bowl. It, it's it's crazy to think of, of how it, it's going. So, you know, I don't know the agent count in Michigan for the largest brokerage, but they're either the largest at this point or we will be in a matter of minutes to be facetious, right? Mm-hmm. So when you think about that and then you think about, okay, there's, there's people involved here. And Vic brought up a great point. You know, if you think about something that Steve Jobs famously said about the iPhone is he said, we took the complex and we made it simple so the average person could use it. So if you're an agent and you can take the complex and make it so simple that your client only thinks that the only thing you did was open the door. Mm-hmm. In my opinion, you have done a phenomenal job yeah. as an agent, right? Absolutely. You, you, you're incredible because you shielded them, like Victor said, from all of the minutia of a transaction. And that's really what it is. It's minutia, right? Because so, even the slam dunk easy deals have minutia. Yeah. yeah. Everyone. Yeah. Yep. So when you circle back around to what you asked, like, hey, where do I see it going? The complexity of the transaction, if if all of us had a W-2 job, 40 hours a week. 800 with, credits go. 20% down. Yes, you wouldn't be needed. No. I wouldn't be needed. Victor wouldn't be needed. Title companies wouldn't be needed. No one would be needed. Right. You would be able Everybody to do this. Everybody just told the truth about their title and their Absolutely. property boundaries. Right. And, yeah. The problem is, is that there's <laughs> yeah. always going to be complexities. Yeah. So I think on some level... You're always going to need people in the mortgage side and the real estate side. What's going to change is the level of sophistication for the people that are doing the job. Talk about, That's what's going to change. Talk about level of sophistication. You know, us loan officers had a pretty easy ride. and Realtors had a pretty easy ride over the last couple of years. But sure. now the market is shifting where inventories are at an all-time low. Yeah. Us loan officers are actually our value is coming to the top because it takes a huge part of a loan officer to become very creative and proactive to help get a, because we are part of getting an accepted offer. Mm -hmm. So now I think loan officers values, the ones that come to the top are going to really shine here in the next couple of years, you know, and on another point, we we talked about uh, this, Nick, previous to the show uh, with the inventories so low, yeah. And the agent count going up so much. Are we going to see a cleansing of the industry in both the mortgage and the real estate world? You know, I, I, this is merely an opinion, but I, I do believe we are. Because what's going to happen is, is that if you look at historically, if you look at the NAR membership, the National Association Realtor membership, if you look back, and I, this is out there in the internet, I'm not saying anything that Nick made up here. This well, it's got to be public. true. It's on the internet. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> you know, you can look up the NAR stats. If you looked at it on a spreadsheet or a chart of some sort, you would see in the early 2000s, you'd see a run up in membership, right? And then when things got hard during the downturn in 2008, 9, 10, you saw a, a rapid decline in membership. And then starting back at about 2014, 15, you started to see that uptick again. And now you're seeing it at historic levels. I think there's you know, 1.7 million realtors across the country that are members of NAR, and that's not including the ones that aren't and and that kind of stuff, right? Licensed realtors that are. So when you look at that and you look at the pie of transactions, because there isn't a way to generate more transactions, right? There's only a certain number of them that are going to happen in 2022. So then it becomes a division of who gets those deals, Mm -hmm. 
And when you start looking at who is the, who are the ones that are going to get the deals, what you're finding is, is that the ones that are really good at it, the 10%, 15%, 20%, the top, they're doing better than they've ever done before, right? The middle is what's suffering and the newbies have no idea. So they're getting in, they're full of excitement and they should be. I was full of excitement when I got in, right? Um, but you're finding that that middle is being gutted. So what's, your, what's happening in, and, and, and you saw this in the last six or seven years, you saw the proliferation of the team structure, right? You saw that happen where an agent couldn't make it on their own, so they joined a team. Well, why'd they join a team? Because the team provided structure, it provided leads, admin. it provided admin support, it provided a way to actually make a living. So that part of it, yes, I do agree with you that you're going to see a certain cleanse. Now, we saw it in 2008, 2009, 2010, history does repeat itself, right? Mm -hmm. we, just, we just, as human beings, don't tend to pay attention for very long. We have a short attention span. So, and I don't mean this like, you know, the real estate apocalypse is coming. Anybody that thinks that we're going to see 2008 over again, 2009, in my opinion, is fooling themselves. The banks are not going to operate the same way they did. Mm -hmm. They've learned their lesson. The government isn't going to operate the same way they did. They learned their lesson. It won't be the same. So if you're waiting for that, you're you're waiting for the wrong thing to happen. So at this at this point, being it's the middle of February mm -hmm. and Michigan is cold, it's lousy, mm -hmm. and we have a very cyclical real estate market. Yep. So we're typically things start picking up March into April. Those yep. are the best months to typically list your home Correct. historically. Correct. Um, we're seeing the lowest inventory levels for even for this time of year than we have ever seen. But Vic and I have discussed, you know, we've got pre-approvals coming in. Mm -hmm. Not that we got a lot of buyers that are getting lucky right now because there's not enough inventory and a lot of people are writing on the same houses. I think the demand's going to be pretty great this year. I think it's going to be exceptionally good to be a seller. Mm -hmm. And with the rate environment moving upward relatively quickly since the beginning of the year, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on that market. Yeah. You I know. Yeah, I would agree to that. I mean, there's there's a hundred percent truth to what you're saying. I mean, you are going to see a tight inventory. There are some new construction products that are going to come online. If you look at when new new housing starts and permits mm -hmm. were pulled, you're going to see a flood of new construction stuff that's going to be completed in the second, third, fourth quarter of this year. You you should anyway. Let's, Have you let's been just... watching Livingston County numbers that too? You know, it's not as tight watching? as I used to, okay. but we've got some new housing starts in Livingston County as well. So, uh, I, But I do think, you think they're building specs or do you think that they're going to be building homes that people have, are already in contract for? I think both okay. because they, they know that if they can at least get a start, they'll get a buyer for it. Yeah. Right. So it's not truly a spec. Well, that we just have waiting for a buyer. Right? We have a lot of buyers that are in contract right now to build that have houses to live. Absolutely. So that is that re yep. in, regardless of the interest rate market, these yeah. buyers are move up buyers. They've already committed to building a house and are going to have a house to put on the market soon. I would agree you with know, you. As we look at this uh, increase in rates and, you know, uh, they actually climbed quite significantly over the last six weeks. Now they seem to level out a little bit, but they're, you know, and like you say, uh, people have short term memories, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, so this will, uh, some people are getting off the fence there for a month or so. Then all of a sudden this is a normal market again yeah. with interest rates, but with the higher interest rates, so yes, yeah, some people can't afford, uh, they're going to be able to afford less, but that actually creates opportunities for other buyers because it's knocking some of these other buyers that now can't afford that home. So, it, you yeah. know, it actually could do that. So I want to talk about two points here is one attitude. You know, we've got attitude amongst younger realtors and older realtors. And sure. uh, and I'm not knocking any realtor, but I, I hear these conversations quite often is that an experienced agent may uh, be talking to a potential home seller. Hey, would you like to sell your home? Yeah, I would if I could find one. Uh, what do you got out there? Well, inventories are low. You may not, you may have to settle. You may not find what you want. And those are all kind of negative type tone statements made. Sure. Now, my daughter had just come into the industry, brand new, deer in the headlights, right? Sure. And she pulled up the listings in Livingston County, says, Dad, there's 87 listings. Not like in 2010 when there was 1,200 on an average all the time, right? She goes, there's 87 listings out there. And she called her buyer and she said, look, there's 87 opportunities out there, you know? So let's go look at all yeah. these homes. So there's yeah. an, an attitude. Mm -hmm. This is a normal market to them, whereas a uh, experienced one... 
somehow may have some negative tone saying that, oh, I'm going to wait for it to shift. I don't know if it's going to shift. Yeah. Any comments on that, Nick? Yeah, it's funny that you say that because one, <laughs> I was on a um, another podcast slash interview. It was during COVID and uh, it was done on Zoom and somebody had asked the question. They said, well, look, you've been in the industry for a while. Like, what's the best piece of advice you could give a brand new person? And this kind of comes back around to what you're saying about attitude. I said, the best piece of advice I would give a brand new person is, is hang on to that new person enthusiasm as long as you humanly possibly can. And the reason I say that is, is because what you're talking about is, is you're talking about becoming jaded, right? You're talking mm -hmm. about becoming um, disgruntled with your own career choice or your own industry choice. And I'm not saying that to be rude to anybody that's been in the industry for a long time. Look, I've been in the industry for a long time. And there are days that I'm frustrated like everybody else. We're all human beings here. But overall, when I look at the overall picture and I say to myself, you know, has this career been good to me? The answer is yes. Do I still enjoy what I'm doing? The answer is yes. Do I love talking about real estate? The answer is yes. Do I like helping people? The answer is yes. So if I can check down those boxes and answer yes to those things, then my attitude towards this career that's been so good to me should remain in that positive category, right? And when you think about it from that perspective, it changes how you look at it. I would challenge those agents, and if they were agents with me and I'm their broker and trying to coach them or help them, I would challenge them to reevaluate why they got into the industry in the first place. Mm -hmm. And if they can't answer yes to all those questions, maybe it's time to retire or do something else or, or get out. But even though things have changed, change has been good in so many yeah, ways, yeah. right? It, it's made all of us better at what we do. The change has made me better. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, the one thing, we can't fight change as loan officers. No. We've been through so many changes. You've got to run with it. No, no. but when, when you're in, a, a, a let's call it a very flexible industry, anybody sure. that is in real estate is 100% commission. Correct. Okay. You have, been, if, if those of us that have been around a while, we remember 08. Yeah. I remember pre-08 when things started to get yeah. bumpy and we didn't know what was coming. You know, it's. The unknown can be very scary, sure. but you have to have a level of confidence, trust, and just move forward and go on oh, by the grace of God, you know, we'll get through whatever's going to happen next. Sure. And, you know, there, housing is essential, yeah. you know, for a lack of a better term, people need to buy homes. They need to sell homes. You know, think about the life events that sure. revolve around real estate. You know, the, one of the strongest things, and Vic and I, we've been talking about this for a couple of years now. The millennial generation is bigger than the baby boomers. Last year, they were about 35% of the first time home buyer market nationwide. That is a huge percentage, right? They're jumping in the market. They're starting families. They're starting careers. Regardless of what is happening in the world, they need houses now. You know, then we have people that have negative life events. They, there might be deaths. There could be divorces. All of those things Job are going to come up. Job yeah. transfers. Yeah. I mean, real estate isn't something that you just always go, okay, and I'm going to save for the next two years and then I'm going to buy a house. You know, life events change and things, you know, we had last year, we had a lot of people that never thought about moving, but guess what? Their jobs changed. Yeah. They were now virtual, yep. you know, and I had, I had a couple of few years. They, they, I did their mortgage four or five years ago. They moved to this area because of a job. He still had the same job, but it, he, he traveled a lot. It didn't matter where he worked or where he lived. So they went back more towards the West side of the state because that's where they left their family and their grandkids were and their children. So, you know, that created an opportunity for a house to become listed. And I said to somebody yesterday, cause I had a client that I pre-approved last year. They never found a house. So they called me to update their pre-approval, run some numbers. And they said, where are interest rates, Danielle? I said, well, here's where they are today. They were shocked. And I, t what I told them is I said, look, you cannot perfectly time buying a house with being at the lowest point with Correct. interest rates. I am in the mortgage industry and I can't do that for myself. I don't have a crystal ball, even though I follow the market daily to say, I think I'm going to refinance my house today because that's the lowest point, right? Nobody has that information. 
I said, you didn't buy last year for whatever reason. It's still a great time to jump into the market. I promise you, if you buy a house this year, you're going to be really happy that you have a house. And if we see interest rates drop again in the next 18 to 24 months, I said, I will be the first person to call you and then we'll refinance and lower your rate. Yeah. You need to be objective conscious, Mm -hmm. not rate conscious. Correct. Because life is going to catch up. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's funny you were saying about change, right? And somebody told me this a long time ago. I never forgot it. They just said, there's really a question here that you have to answer for yourself. And it's the future is going to happen. The question really is, is are you going to participate or not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? That's kind yeah. of a cold point. And, and, and it's like, okay. I mean, it's going to happen regardless. If I right. sit on the sidelines, it's going to happen. Right. If I participate, it's going to happen. I'm going to choose to participate in yep. the future. Yeah. I'm not going to just watch it happen. So that's really what you have to ask yourself. It's funny, the last election, and this is not a political thing. I had an agent, I was still running brick and mortar at the time, had an agent come into my office. It's the day before the election. They sat in there. They're all distraught. What's going to happen? Oh my gosh. You know, what do you think? What if, what if Biden wins? What if Trump wins? It's, and I, I listened for a few minutes and I said, uh, here's what I know for sure. I've been through elections with real estate in my entire career. Here's Mm -hmm. what I know for sure. We're going to sell houses today, which is the day before election. We're Mm going to sell houses tomorrow, the day of the election. And we're going to sell houses the day after the election. Yep. That is a constant. Whatever happens in between, I don't care. And and, and, and it's one of those things like you just have to ask, you just have to, again, Clear the mechanism. Yeah. And pay attention and, and to what you can everything has right? been so politicized. And this is right. just a general statement. Okay. Yeah. I don't care where you watch your news, where you listen to your news. Everything for the past few years has been politicized. Sure. You know, I said to Jim, cause he said he was the same way with the election, right? What is that going to mean to the mortgage business? What is it going to do to the business? And I said, look, I said, I don't, for, I don't care who's in yeah. the office because nothing changes for you. Well, it does. But sometimes when one party's in the mortgage business is better because the economy's worse. You know, if the economy gets bad, they're going to drop rates and then we're going to refi people and save people money and help restructure things. You know, if, if real estate's strong and we're selling houses, well, let's get people mortgages because people want houses. You know, I'm, you can't be reactionary. Things are going to change and you're going to evolve. I mean, if you talk about the aging process, you know, let's look at people. I know I've seen people that are 80 years old that are sharp as somebody that's 40. Sure. Right. Because they have stayed engaged, stayed engaged in life. Yeah. You know, if you stop participating in life and I've told my husband, you know, for 25 years, I said, I'm not going to retire. Right. Yeah. I, I may, I may slow down and say, I'm not going to work 60 hours a week sure. or 80 hours a week. Right. But I don't ever plan on disengaging in life. Sure. That's my strategy. I'll let you know in 30 or 40 years how it works <laughs> out. But, you know, we'll, we can be old and be on a boat and, and discuss and we'll discuss the next, the past 30 years. But, you know, you go stay engaged. Absolutely yeah. stay engaged. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what your path is in life. Stay engaged, stay active. And the same thing with real estate. You know what? It's going to change. We're going to weather storms. And sometimes Detroit market feels things in the economy very, very different. Um, My stepfather, when I moved to Michigan in the mid 80s, told me that Detroit will feel a recession about three years prior to the rest of the country. In my entire career, That's been the case. Now, we're less dependent on automotive economy-wise, which has certainly made Michigan a lot stronger. But, you know, is there a recession coming? Probably. Is it necessary? It's not going to be what we saw in 08. It probably is going to be a little bit of a good correction. And sometimes recessions are so short that by the time we realize we were really in the recession, we're we're already on the way out. That's just the inevitable know. change. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to bring something up about sure. change because, you know, EXP is changing the landscape, yeah. I, I, I guess, here. Yeah. You know, and we go about change about EXP is, I guess, going against the grain sure. is another sure. way to put mm-hmm. it. So when I look at real estate and look at realtors and who actually creates the real estate market when I, and I keep th- thinking about that. And a lot of people say, well, uh, the, uh, you know, the buyers do the sellers, the ones who list. Well, no, if they didn't list their house or had no means to list it, it couldn't go on the MLS system. It's the realtor that lists that home. If they had no one to call to find out about another house, that's the real estate's, the realtor's job. 
So to me, it's actually the realtor creates the market, mm -hmm. not the consumer. And when we're in this current situation where we've got low inventory, we are all going with the grain waiting for sellers to list their home. So why don't we go against the grain? And this is just me going down in a rabbit hole is why don't we see more people selling their hose, house contingent on them finding a house and switch the grain completely 180 degrees on its side? Because if one person does that, they create another listing. That agent can now have open houses and bring buyers that maybe don't have a home to sell and they're willing to wait 60 days or something for that potential seller to buy a home. And if we had more than one, more than two, more than three, I think last week we had 87 listings in Livingston County for residential. But if we told all our agents at whatever company say, hey, let's go out there and I want you to explain to our sellers, look, we want you to try to list contingent on you finding a home to buy. And if we had 30 or 40 agents do that in this county, boom, we just increased our listing capacity by 50%. And now there's more things. It's just a rabbit hole theory but I think we as individuals, loan people and uh, realtors, we create the market. Why couldn't we go against the grain and create something like that? Or is that just like ludicrous? Well, you're talking about a much bigger issue. And the issue okay. is, is that you have to have agents that are A, willing. And, I, and I, what I mean by that is, is that I tell my kids this all the time, yep. right? Want to and willing to have to be in alignment or nothing happens. Okay. So I hear a lot from people and agents. Oh, I want to make hundred thousand dollars a year. Oh, I want to sell $40 million a year with real estate. I want, I want, I want. The problem is, is I don't see the actions, the willing to actions to go along with the want to. Okay. So they're out of alignment. So anytime those two things are out of alignment, nothing happens. And, and that's, that's just nature of life. Right. I tell, I tell my 19 year old that, right. I hear you. I hear the want to. I just don't see the willing to. Mm -hmm. And what also is happening to the new agent, and I mean this with no disrespect, my first broker, I thought he was an absolute jerk and a half. He was this guy. Here's how I was trained. First day I get there, he sat me down at a desk. He gave me a legal pad, a ruler, a red pen, and a white pages for the city that I was in. It was this thick. He said, write this down. And he gave me a script. He said, start with the A's. And cross out the name if they say no and go and go from there, right? Glenn, Gary, Glenn Ross. Yeah, right. So this, this is what he did. When I finally got somebody that said yes, and this was the script. Hi, this is Nick from ABC Realty. Is Mrs. Smith home? Mrs. Smith, are you interested in buying or selling any real estate today? If she says yes, put her on hold, come get me. If she says no, thank her and ask her if she knows somebody. If she says yes, put her on hold, come get me. If she says no, thank her, name it in the, with the red pen and move on to the next name. Here's what happened. He taught me what I needed to know when I needed to know it. Here's the problem with what we do today with agents. We're going to train you on every possible thing that you think you need to know about the real estate industry and or market. So we make you feel good by the learning process, but we don't teach you how to do. There isn't enough doing in our industry. There's way too much learning. There's way too much Go to this class, go to that class, hire this coach, hire that coach, go here and listen to this, watch these 87 YouTube videos. Then when you're done with that, Google search how to do the best expired listing, how to do this, how to do that. The, the reality of it is, is that we're literally doing these agents a disservice. We really need to make them do and not learn because they will, internship experience. They, they will learn yeah. by doing, right? And, and I say this all the time. And, you know, of course, I'm going to get pushback. And I came from a brokerage that was heavy, heavy, heavy on the training and was known. I spent 15 years at this brokerage. They were known for their training platform. And even, that, even now, they are trying to get away from that moniker a little bit and change and now call themselves a technology company and not a training company. And the reason why they're doing that is, is they're even realizing we're spending a lot of time and a lot of energy training people how to do nothing. And it's really the power is in the doing. And that's really what you're talking about. You're talking about the power being in the doing. I could say that if Danielle hired me tomorrow to be the manager of Highlands Residential Mortgage 
and you've got new loan officers, what's the first thing we need to teach them how to do? I don't give a crap about filling out a 1003. I need them to get some clients. Mm -hmm. I can teach them how to fill out a 1003. That's the easy part. But we think we need to put them through documents and processes right. and procedures. And you need to learn how to do this. And you need to learn how to do that. Get the client in the door. Get, we'll work our way backwards. Right. Get me a client. And I promise you, I will teach you the rest of it. And oh, yeah, by the way, it'll actually stick because it's going to mean something to you because you actually have a client. And you'll, you'll remember what you did. You'll remember what you did. He, and that's he, exactly yeah. what Bob did to me. Right. As soon as I got somebody that said, yes, I, I was so excited. I swear to you, you would have thought Santa Claus came and gave me my Christmas present. I put him on hold. I ran into his office. I'm like, Bob, Bob, <laughs> I got somebody. They said yes. Yeah. And he came out there. He said, okay, get a pen and paper. Write down everything I say. And you, it was like an eighth grade science yeah. project. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. writing down notes. notes. <laughs> like I'm, you would have thought I was scribing the Ten Commandments on a piece of paper. You know what I mean? I'm, da, 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 da. And I missed a few words and everything. He's like, did you get that? We've got an appointment Thursday at five o'clock. I'll show you the next steps. Tomorrow morning, we learn how to do a CMA. Because he taught me what I needed right. to know when I needed to know it. Right. That, that really resonates, man, because I, I could almost feel and see it. It became part of your DNA, man. Yeah, absolutely. You know, he did me a huge favor. I thought he was a jerk and a half, to be honest with you. Oh. But he did me a huge, huge favor. Kind of the favor. school of hard knocks. School of hard knocks. I tell my kids to cut all... the lawn. Just cut the lawn. But they don't. They still yeah. don't do that. You so know? it's the willing to that's missing, right? You've got a bunch of new agents out there, and it's the willing to. Well, you know, I got a call yesterday from a longtime friend and an agent of mine who is got a client. They already own a house, so they'll mm -hmm. need to sell, and. She was asking questions about, well, how about this kind of financing, that kind of financing? What can we do? Can we find them a house before they list kind of a thing? And I, what I ended up telling her, I said, there's too many variables. So if the agents have people that want to buy, that don't, that have a house that they need to sell, we don't know anything about them until they talk to a lender, right? That's the realtor's job is not to necessarily come up with that game plan, right? Of what the buyer can afford. What do they have for down payment? Can, you know, we've talked about, can they buy before they sell? Do they need to sell first and then buy, you know, all of these things. So, you know, in regards to your rabbit hole, Vic, I love that strategy, but the realtors don't know what they don't know because many of these buyers, because they know that they're well-qualified people, right. haven't even talked to a loan officer, so they don't know what their options are. So could they potentially put their house on the market with a clause subject to the seller yeah. finding the right home, you know, um, you know yeah. and, and shift the market a little bit instead of everybody sitting on the fence afraid, well, afraid to sell their house because they won't have a right. place to go. Well, it goes to change your attitude change your life, sure. you know, and it, let's say, I would uh, assume that every, a lot of agents out there have two, three people that would just love to sell, but there's nothing on the market. Right. Why not have a conversation with those three potential sellers and say, look, I've got several other clients. Let's just list it and sell it contingent upon us finding a home yeah. in 60 days. People will take that offer. If you don't sell it in 60 days, rip up the contract. We put it, we list it again and we go again, but right. we're, we're creating mm -hmm. that momentum. Sure. It's a lot more paperwork for the agent, but we're doing something. Yeah. All you got to do to be a star in this life is do something because the rest well, of us are doing nothing. There's a lot of people right now that are going to be thinking about listing their house in the next 30, 60, 90 days. Sure. And it could be a planned event. It could be a family life change event, you know, and then, um, you know, it's like, yeah, these people are thinking about this in February. You know, the painters, you know, I would honestly, realtors should be hanging out in the par local carpeting store, <laughs> parking lot, <laughs> dropping business cards yeah, because, yeah, you know, yeah. there's people that are going to be going in to buy the new carpet to get right. ready to freshen up the house. And But these home yeah. sellers who've been sitting there for six months waiting for something mm -hmm. to come on the market. Well, your way ain't working. Let's right. try something else and get right. creative and give it a shot, man. Right. Yeah. We might be able to hit something here. Yeah. And Nick, right. this is your this is your backyard. I don't know. I'm going no, off on a no, tangent. I, 
I'm not, I'm not saying that you're wrong. Uh-huh. I understand that. If you break it down, again, we talked about taking the complex and make it simple. What is a realtor's job function? I need to find a willing seller and a willing buyer. I mean, that, right. that was the job function. If you take it back pre-MLS... That's what realtors did, right? right? I would list this property and then I would go out to my circle of people and find a buyer, right? I bring those two together. I'm I'm a matchmaker. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm married. I'm right. I'm marrying people together. So if you break it down to that simple function, what's happened is, is that again, want to versus willing to, they're not willing to prospect enough to find the willing seller and the willing buyer and marry them together. That's what you're saying here. Mm -hmm. And what's happening in that fold is, is that, you know, the internet's been great, but it's also provided some laziness at the same time, right? I'll just wait for a Zillow lead or I'll wait for a realtor.com lead, or I'll wait for somebody to click on this Facebook ad. And then now I have, you know, a live one here that I can't find a house for <laughs> that I can't find a house for. So what you're saying is, is you're saying, Hey, let's think differently let's here. Create let's, the market. Let's, let's go out to a seller and say, look, Mr. Seller, I know that you want to sell your house, but you're worried that you can't find another one. So how about this? You know, let's put you in touch with a lender first and find out what your financing options are and find out if you can afford to buy something without selling. That's the first step. step let's yeah. talk about that. Plan right? a plan a right. And if you can't, then let's talk about listing your home differently, right? Now, go. that's going to take, though, that's going to take a different mindset. That's going to take a different experience level. And I'm not saying that a new person can't pull that off. Right. They can, but they need a mentor to show them how to do that, yep. right? And what's happened with the run-up of the market since 2014-15, we've created a situation where... We don't have that brain trust to be able to do that. You're talking about that as a 25 plus year veteran. I'm talking about that as a 30 plus year veteran. You're talking about yep. that as a 30 plus year veteran. Your people that have been in the industry for two years have no clue. Three yep. years, no clue. And I'm not picking on them. Yep. They need a better mentor is what they need, right? You want to know how to do something? You have to go to somebody that's already done it before you. Right. But right? even even, I hate to say, even a real estate agent that's been in the business 10 years, not so okay. much. Yeah. The, the, we're what the concepts we're talking about here are things that nobody has seen or done. Well, it's uncomfortable. Years. It is, but yeah. I mean go go back to I remember hearing stories about real estate in the 80s, yeah. right? Interest yeah. rates were 16 to 18% and one of the creative strategies years ago, which this wouldn't entirely work today, but the seller sometimes would give the buyer a land contract. Sure. Sure. Right. Yeah. They got really creative in the 1980s to keep real estate moving. And you know what? I love to hear the stories when I get clients that have been homeowners for years. I'll ask them. I'll say, when did you buy your first house? What was the interest rate of your first house? And how did you do it? Because I hear these stories about ultimately creative things that happened back then. And, And they'll tell you. They go, I don't even know how we got it, but we made it work. And yeah, we might've struggled a little bit, but we needed a place to live. We were married. We had kids, we had babies, you know, and you go, okay, they made it work. Sure. So to think outside the box in 2022 to go, could we do something different today to make it work? It's going to take trusted real estate professionals. I mean, it's not going to work if we don't have good relationships with the real estate professionals who can lead and, you know, educate the sellers on what their options are, educate the buyers and try to put something together that might work. I mean, if somebody is willing to wait for a house for six months or a year to build, maybe they'd wait 60 days so yeah, that they yeah. could give the seller an opportunity to go out and find a house. Well, but, but looking at this, you know, because, you know, there's power in numbers and this word can't come from realtor A to seller A. It's got to be several realtors or us as a community with all the brokerages sending this message because just think if all the brokerages mm-hmm. went out to all their sellers and say, look, let's all, let, you know, let's go sell our houses contingent on buying something. Boom, we'd have a flood of of listings, yeah. you know, and, and, and I know we won't get the, uh, the whole community involved or all the brokerages, but it's almost like saying, Mr. Seller tried our way for six weeks. If you don't like it, we'll refund your misery. Let's yeah. just go. <laughs> uh, let's, let's try this strategy because it hasn't been working and let's, let's just try it out and, and go against the grain and be creative, which to me, which would separate that realtor from another potentially. It could, uh, I would agree with that. Um, you know, again, you're talking about thinking differently. It's so funny because if you, 
things have changed from the downturn, but they really haven't. It was, I had this conversation not too long ago. We were doing the same things now that we were doing then. Guess what we were doing back in 2008 and nine? appraisal guarantees. Doesn't that sound familiar? <laughs> hmm. We were just doing them the other way because we thought the thing was going to come in cotton picking low because we didn't have any comps to support yeah. the price, right? right? right. Uh, guess what we were doing? Multiple offers from investors. Mm-hmm. Doesn't that sound familiar? Yeah, multiple the low offers, ballers. right? Yeah. Uh, multiple uh, low balls. <laughs> high, highest and best. Oh, doesn't that sound familiar from yeah. 2008? You know, I'm, I'm like, and it's so funny because everybody thinks, oh my gosh, this is brand new. You know, all this stuff is brand new. It's not. It's recycled. Um, we're doing it just on the other side. It's like a mirror image of itself. It's just the reverse. Yeah. It's higher prices. Yes, you're selling at the top of the chart, but you're buying at the top of the chart. Back then you sold at the bottom and you bought at the bottom. It, it's just a mirror reverse image yeah. of itself. And it's always funny because you get the question, especially if you've been doing it a long time, like, what did you do during the downturn? And it's like short sales, leases, mm-hmm. BPOs, sold bank owned properties, listed bank owned properties. You figured it out. If you were a real estate professional, and you were in the industry, or if you're a mortgage person and you were in the industry, you figured it out. I mean, if you guys went to bed tonight, like a snowstorm and tomorrow morning woke up and interest rates were at 8%, you wouldn't be like, that's it. I'm out. I quit. Go well, I would have a minute. <laughs> they're, they're at 8%. Yeah. <laughs> you would just figure out a way to do the business yeah. at 8% is what you would do. Yeah. Because it, people, there's the need. The, the need the, is the need. There. Correct. We'll figure it away. Yeah. God. So you're going to see some downward pressure to come, you know, yeah. as this thing changes a little bit more. Well, Nick, I tell you what, we got to wrap up the yep. show here, you know, and uh, for our audience, could you please give a, a website or email, your name, yeah, phone absolutely. number, so somebody get a hold of you? Absolutely. So you can find me at realestatebynick.com as my website. You can email me at nick at realestatebynick.com. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at the same. That's very good. Danielle, any closing words? Thank you so much, Nick. It was a pleasure. We're, we're going to have to go back and have the movie conversation uh, that yeah, we had yeah, yeah, yeah. before we started really good recording. Show. Nick, any words to our audience or potential realtors? What's your words of wisdom? Words of wisdom. You got to hustle every single day. This is a lifestyle. It is not a job, guys. Hustle every day. I'm Victor Bales. That's Danielle Boat. We'll see you here next time on A Smarter Way Home. This world better